Thank you, Peggy. That was, lo that was wonderful. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, if you'd indulge me for just one second, uh, I was going to make an announcement, but I was busy back there. Uh, deacons. We need deacons for May. Um, so please, I've got a new sign-up sheet on the inside of the door back there. So if you're a deacon and you can help us out in May, please uh, sign up back there. Thank you. Okay. Um, good morning. We have the call to worship. If you would uh, follow along in your uh, in the bulletin, Creator God, forever creating anew. God of changing events and surprising turns. God of inner depths and majestic heights. Still small voice and eternal mystery. Him is welcome to this house. It's in uh, the small black paperback on page seven. be seated. I invite our young, our next generation to come forward. I'm going to teach you a new language this morning. And do we have a microphone? Wonderful. Good, good. 
and Ducky's not here either. We're no stuffed animals with us. I said, that's okay, because they can't talk, and this morning we're going to talk. All right. Hi, Darcy. Good to see you. Okay, so um, when you learn a new language, it's important to learn to speak it as well. So um, let's crowd in just a little bit so you, we can hear your voices. So Izzy, if you can hold it up, everyone's going to repeat after me, okay? Y'all ready? The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Hey, I got an idea. Why don't you, can you come over here, you two? And then, and then come all the way over. Get right in front of these. Newer, you're the newer generation and you're the older generation. Can you believe that? Yeah, I know. They're actually the older generation. You're the next generation. Come on, come on in, Darcy. Great. Okay, let's do another line. I shall not want. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. Right. He leadeth me beside still waters. He leadeth me beside still waters. Are there any youth on? No. Zoom, I just wanted to welcome them. Okay. All right, thanks. I just wanted to check. Um, he restoreth my soul. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness. For his name's sake. For his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley. Yea, though I walk through the valley. Of the shadow of death. Of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff. Thy rod and thy staff. They comfort me. They comfort me. Thou preparest a table. Thou preparest a table. Before me in the presence of mine enemies. Before me in the presence, presence of, of my enemies. enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy. Surely goodness and mercy. Shall follow me all the days of my life. Shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever. Congratulations, you have learned to speak King James version of Psalm 23, Elizabethan language. Any of that familiar to you? Kind of weird, isn't it? What was the hardest word to say? Hardest word in there to say. Have you ever heard anointest? Thou anointest me? What about thou? Have you heard thou? Uh, no. You've heard thou? Yes. Thou? How about runneth? No. No? What is runneth? What does that mean, run? Mm. <laughs> Don't know? What about you? What did he say? Run over. Run over? Okay, I didn't hear that. Okay, great. All right, um, um, let's see. Restoreth. Restoreth. How about that? To restore something. Okay, good, good. And leadeth me. Leadeth me. To lead. Very good, very good. So you, you're interpreting, you're translating that language into today's language. Did you ever think this morning you would be learning the old English? <laughs> no. There was a king named King James in England. You know, you've heard of Queen Elizabeth, right? Well, way back when, 400 years ago, there was a king named King James, and he wanted the Bible to be translated into his language and that country, which was English. But back then, they spoke what is called an Elizabethan language. So they had these all these other words. But harder English, there you go, which, which eventually, 400 years later, we're talking a whole different language, right? We wouldn't say thou or thee. Or runneth over but we've got a new language that 
brings up the same images and reminds us, thou art with me, you are with me. And the first thing that says the Lord is my shepherd, do you guys know anything about shepherds? There are people who, uh, they, something with sheep, I can't sheep. think of it. Yep. <laughs> They're not a real familiar thing. Have you all seen, have you ever seen a shepherd? No. No? No. 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 Never seen a shepherd, right? So it's kind of hard to imagine what a shepherd is. You know, remember at Christmas when it said that the, the shepherds were out watching their flock at night? So the shepherds are in the Bible a lot because it's a familiar image to them. So I was thinking about a familiar image to you guys. What would you say about someone who provides for you, that gives you food and water and air and teaches you right ways? Can you name, just name one, what comes to mind when I say those things? Food and water and sustenance and Places that are not dangerous. Do you mean like a symbol that kind of represents that stuff? Yeah, a symbol. That'd be fine. Okay, a cross. The cross. Okay. How about you, Lily? What was the question? Hmm? What was the question? Oh, sorry. Um, sorry. That's okay. Who provides you food and water and rest? My parents. Your parents. Okay. Same here. Same here. How about your grandparents? Yes. All right, okay. <laughs> parents and grandparents. There you go. You're already in there, Gil and Sue. How about you guys? Who provides you food? Parents. Parents. Uh, parents do. What? What about rest? Where do you rest? Uh, couches or beds. There you go. Couches or beds. So can you think? The Lord is my couch. The Lord is my bed the lord is my cross the lord is my what's the question the lord is my parents and grandparents so the idea is is you step into that psalm you learn the language from back then you learn the language today and you learn images about how you're provided for yeah yeah okay let us say our prayer together we are wonderful we are wonderful we are kind we are kind we are brave. We are, brave. We are loved. We are loved. Yay, God. Thank you guys for coming up. It's new members. So we come now to um, just stay seated for now. I'm going to say a few words before you guys run up here. I know you're eager to join and all, but when we have new members, it's it's always interesting to think about people joining us and expanding our family of faith. There is something in the bylaws. How many of you read the bylaws? <laughs> okay, a few of us have read the bylaws because we're our leaders here, and it's part of our pledge is to read the bylaws. But I want to read a few lines in it because I think it's important to remember who we are as a church. United Church of Christ, Parker Hilltop, is a progressive church within the Christian faith. We revere scripture as our most sacred resource for understanding our historical faith, our relationship with God as a church, our call from Jesus to act in all things compassionate and just, our living relationship with God's spirit, we construe scripture historically, sacramentally, and metaphorically, rather than literally, to support all human life and other life, and to celebrate the love of all God's children, and to extend good news of Jesus to all persons without exception. We are a non-creedal church. We affirm the responsibility of every member to make this faith their own in worship and honesty of thought, expression, and impurity of heart. It's really a pretty interesting statement, a statement of faith, a statement of who you are as a church. And I want to highlight the line that says, the responsibility of every member to make this faith their own. In other words, this is a church that doesn't tell you what to believe. 
This is a church that gives you the opportunity to make what you believe and how you want to live your own. To make it your own. That's, that's a like grown-up faith, right? We don't tell you you have to say the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed or the creeds from ancient days. We say, what is it you believe today? What's important to you? How do you want to live your life? And so this, this was a conversation I had with Ben and Sandy and Scott. What is it you believe? And maybe not so much believe, but how do you want to act in this world? Who do you want to be? Why is it you want to be a part of this church? I had conversations with each of them about who they are, where they are in their faith journey, and what they bring to us. And I think in my short time of getting to know them, I think we all know Ben brings us the gift of music and the gift of sound. And I also think a sense of purity of heart. He always reminds me in prayer time just the simplest, most profound kind of prayers that we pray. And you're always willing to offer that to us. And so I appreciate you for that. And glad you're a part of our faith family and look forward to hearing, hearing more from you. Um, Sandy, I actually met at what I will call a progressive book study. Um, it was at Books Are Awesome here in Parker. I don't know if any of you have been there, but it was a uh, book club that we had with the Unitarian Church and Roger, the minister, had picked out a book there called How Do Democracies Die? So we'd been through chapters in this book and talking about democracy and the state of democracy in this country. And one night this woman shows up, Sandy, and I said, oh, are you a member of the Unitarian? No, I'm not a member of any church. I'm just here because I saw the title, How Do Democracies Die? And Sandy just contributed so much to that, last, that um, book group that night. So many interesting questions with her experience in working in the government, her experience in law, her ex experience in understanding and her fight for democracy. So she's here and brings us questions. What do we think and believe? And she's been in a number of other book studies and always asks questions from another perspective. And we need that in this church. We need someone who's saying, but what? What are you saying? What does that mean? What do you believe? I don't believe that. <laughs> and isn't that fun to learn from each other? And Scott, Scott, Scott. I have learned from Scott that he was born in the Congregational Church in Kansas. Kansas City. Actually, it was the Disciples of Christ, right? Disciples of Christ Christian Church, which is a sister church of the United Church of Christ. And his life journey has been within Christian churches, Disciples of Christ. And then they're coming to us from Windermere Congregational Union Church in Windermere, Florida. So they're transferring their membership in from us. And Scott went through a litany of things that he's been involved in in churches, been on boards, been on council, taught church school or Sunday school. And he's bringing a wealth of experience as a member of the community of faith that makes faith your own. And I want you to know that and feel proud of that as a, as a church. There's so many churches that say, bring what you have and share it with us. I don't know if you remember the line from um, Alice Walker's book, The Color Purple, when Shogun, I can't remember the other character, but they're talking, one of them says, I'm going to church this morning to get God. I'm going there to get God. And the other one says, you don't go get God at church, you go share God. You go share, and so you come this morning to share God, to share a piece of your life, to share where you are in life. And so these members come to share their journey and their understanding of the world with us, their understanding of God. So I invite Ben and Sandy and Scott to come forward and our vice moderator, Kay, to come forward. And if you'll open your bulletin um, under where it says new member vows, there'll be a part where you join in. Ben is joining by certificate of baptism he brought me on August 2016. 
He was baptized at the Rocky Mountain Community Church. Wonderful. Come on up here, maybe right up here. And um, let's turn around so we face the camera. You can be over here. That's fine. Um, and they say three simple things, so I don't think we'll need the microphone. <laughs> we'll be, I think they'll, they'll project loud enough. So I'm going to actually step this way. Do you desire to join this church? I do. There you go. And share your faith with us. I do. Great. Do you promise by the grace of God to follow the ethical principles of the Christian church to resist oppression and evil and to show love and justice as best you are able? I do need a microphone. Oh. With you. Do you promise to participate in the life and mission of this church, sharing regularly in the worship and fellowship and giving your time, talent, and treasure so that we may continue to serve this community? I do. Okay, welcome from the congregation. Let us, the members of the congregation, rise if able and welcome them using the printed words in the bulletin. We welcome you to join the church. Promise you our friendship and prayers as we share in the hopes and labors of the church. We are grateful you have joined us on this faith journey and look forward to the ways you will enrich our church. On behalf of UCC Parker Hilltop, we extend to you our hand of Christian love welcome you to our fellowship have the certificates printed yet but they are coming so you get handwritten ones. handwritten certificate which is even more meaningful Gene. Gene. out there. I'm so grateful you're on the journey. It's ethical principles. Grateful, Scott. My handwritten certificate there. Oh, you may be seated. Joys and concerns uh, in the newsletter. Uh, they're the same as last week. So uh, are there any others that you would, uh, who want to share joy and concern? The joy today, obviously, is three new members. Okay. And, uh, Scott? I'd like to express my concern for the families of the uh, four uh, Apache pilots, three deceased and one, uh, seriously in the hospital in Alaska and uh, the investigation is uh, kind of under our son who's the brigade deputy for operations and training and a uh, former uh, Apache pilot well current still uh, so he may know these pilots himself and uh, since they're in his unit, uh, so we'll see how it goes for the one remaining and their families. Okay, thank you. Any others? I have Anna. one. Um, I'd like to request prayers for my longtime neighbor and friend and was going to be traveling partner on my trip to the Galapagos, Sarah Peters. Some of you may remember her. She was a member of the congregation at one point. She had a terrible fall and um, had surgery yesterday and is scheduled for more surgery this week and possibly a third one. She really messed up her leg and knee. So healing prayers for Sarah Peters, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there any on Zoom? Okay, thank you. I spoke with Heidi Bailey this week to see how Megan was doing. 
Um, and they're still perplexed. They don't know why she's continuing to have seizures. They have changed her medication, and she's taking some new medication, so they're hoping to see relief from that. But we want to hold the Bailey family in our prayers as well. And then there was also mention in the newsletter of Gary Ebert's father who passed away. Um, he lives in Texas. And I reached out to him, but I haven't heard from them. Does anyone know if they've gone down there for a service? No? Let's hold Gary and his family in prayer as well. Uh, it, our prayers include the uh, singing of a song in the Worship and Rejoice, the Red Hymnal, Raise a Song of Gladness. So let's get that out before I offer prayers. And um, Paul will sing that for us and also sing the Latin for us. Gentle Shepherd, thank you for the way you have led us to this sanctuary, a place of rest and peace. Our earth has received rains this week, greening our landscape, renewing all of life. So we thank you for the water and the food and the air that sustains us. While some of us have sat at tables with overflowing goodness. Others may have walked through dark valleys, valleys of sickness or grief or uncertainty or fear. But you have met us both at table and in those dark nights, for thou art with us. Let us sing. Raise the song of gladness. Peoples of the earth, Christ has come, bringing peace, joy to every heart. We also lift up places in the world where there is war, especially mindful of Ukraine and Sudan. We pray for places around the world in dark valleys of despair and death and hunger and poverty and mourning for those who have died. May your peace and comfort your food and water come to them. We pray for this country, for our leaders, for the ways we are finding our way, maybe stumbling at times, the ways we are learning and always working and striving towards a healthy freedom of speech, the freedom to worship the God of our beliefs, the freedom from want and the freedom from fear for all people. Praise the 
Shepherding God, you guide us with your spirit. You call to us when we wander off or when life takes us into a valley. Hear now in this time of silence the things on our hearts, the people, the places, our joys and our struggles. We pray that our acts of kindness and compassion and justice be ways that we shepherd those in our community. So renew us with your love and peace as we say together the words that Jesus taught his disciples. Our creator who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our wrongs as we forgive those who have wronged us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> you may. This is a new interpretation of the 23rd Psalm from Psalms for Living, an invitation to wholeness by Nan Merrill. Oh, my beloved, you are my shepherd. I shall not want. You bring me to green pastures for rest and lead me beside still waters, renewing my spirit. You restore my soul. You lead me in the path of goodness to follow love's way. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I am not afraid, for you are ever with me. Your rod and your staff, they guide me. They give me strength and comfort. You prepared a table before me in the presence of all my fears. You bless me with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the heart of the beloved forever. Amen. A few years ago, Lutheran Seminary did a study. They wanted to find out in the country how many people knew passages from the Bible. How many people knew things in the Bible? And their survey asked, is there a text that is important to you in difficult times? They had asked this of about, I think it was 1,500 people, and they had interviewed about 200 people in 12 sites around the United States, and they had interviews with them, and they asked them, is there a text that is important to you when you're in a difficult situation? And the top one was, of course, Psalm 23. How many of you would have said that? Psalm 23. Psalm 23. When do you usually hear Psalm 23? At a funeral. At a funeral, right? Did you learn it at a funeral? Memorial service, repeating it? No, some of you didn't. Um, 
there's something about that that when we think of it, it kind of conjures up maybe a memorial service or somebody that we know that we loved and has passed. We think of them. But the psalm is really about everyday living. It's about food. It's about rest. It's about where to go to get water. It's about safety, shelter, protection, a presence with us. All those things are what we need every day. Not just when we're mourning, not just when there's a death. So I want us to think this morning about it as a day-to-day -day instruction or offering. Now, if you're like me, I learned it from the King James Version. How many of you learned that version, King James Version? And now our children know it. <laughs> right, ask them on the way home if they remember it. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me thy rod and thy staff. Wow. This, I think, is what lends itself to death, shadow of death. But all the other translations don't say that. They just say the darkest valley. But I think that's what drew people to it, that valley of death. Difficult times, nevertheless. But we experience those in everyday life as well. So this morning, I want to separate it from that occasion of death and mourning and think about it how it comes to us, and how we live it. It's a psalm of comfort, for sure. That image of God as shepherd. How many paintings have we seen with the man walking across a green field and sheep following him? Or Jesus carrying a lamb on his shoulder? And hearing those words that Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Think of all the beautiful music it's set to. King of love my shepherd is, he leadeth me. But there's also a newer uh, translation. I don't know if you've heard Bobby McFerrin's. I wanted to play it for you this morning, but it is copyrighted, Carlos said, and we can't play that. But he uses, he dedicated it to his mother and he uses the feminine image of God. She is my shepherd. She has provided for me. I shall dwell in her house forever. So that idea of Jesus as shepherd or God as shepherd is one of the prevailing images of who God is. And um, this psalm is attributed to King David. We all know who King David was, or at least have heard of him, and that he was a great king in his time. But he was also a very unethical, could I say, king at times. And some of the things he did. But this was written at the end of his life, and he's reflecting back on it. And so I imagine him walking in a field one evening, and he's thinking back on his life, and he thinks of God as a shepherd, because he knows what a shepherd does. You see, as a young man, he was selected to be a king. When he was a young man out in the fields tending his father's sheep, he knows how to care for sheep and how to provide for them, how to get them to food and water and where the safe paths are. He remembered fending off wolves and bears, that rod to beat them away, and then that staff with a hook on it to pull them out of the water or to grab them before they fall off the cliff. Have you ever wondered what that big shepherd's crook is that the bishops and the religious folks are standing there with. That's the image they're projecting is the image of a good shepherd, something that will grab you and pull you back in if you are wandering, something that reminds you of God as a shepherd. And so often we get the image of Jesus or God as a tender, compassionate one who cares for all of the flock 24-7, watching day and night to protect them. But it's also a tough job. When young David was still growing up and becoming a king, he wanted to convince King Saul that he was capable of fighting Goliath, that big giant. And king Saul's having none of it. But 
His argument is, David says, I take care of my father's sheep. Anytime a lion or a bear carries off a lamb, I go after it and I attack it and I rescue it. If the lion or bear go after me, I grab it by the throat and I beat it to death. How is that for an image <laughs> of God? Okay, no calm and peaceful. But that's part of the compassion is it takes courage to protect. I think we're so familiar with this psalm that sometimes when we first hear that, the Lord is my shepherd, we just all go out the window with that idea of shepherd and we don't really hear it. So this morning, that's why I asked Paul to read a different version of it. Because if you're like me and you memorized it, if someone else is saying it, you want them to say the word that you said. <laughs> if you get caught and you say, wait, that isn't, that isn't what it says. You hear about it differently if you hear about it, my beloved, thinking of God as beloved. <clears throat> I remember the first time I heard this psalm. Well, I kind of heard it. You know my hearing and all. Nine years old, I think I've told you before, our grandmother lived with us. She actually lived in the room next to me. And every evening I would go in there and tell her goodnight. I don't know, for some reason this evening I went in a little early. And uh, my grandmother was kneel kneeling down on the side of her bed. I looked, you know, she was talking and I, I thought something had happened. And so I, I ran in and said, what are you doing? What happened? And she looks up at me and she says, I'm praying. I said, oh, I thought you had fallen out of the bed and hurt yourself. She said, no, I'm praying. I'm, I'm saying Psalm 23. I said, oh. So that was the beginning of my lessons, my Episcopal lessons of learning the King James Version of Psalm 23 and many other things. She became my teacher for that Psalm. So when she died many years later, and we were saying that Psalm out loud at her very Episcopal memorial service, I remember thinking of her teaching me that the Lord is my shepherd. And I, I, said, I said that and I thought, my grandmother is my shepherd. My grandmother is my shepherd. She was the one who provided for me. She was the one that kept me from safety. She was the one I ran to and who would gather me in and hold me. The one that taught me Christian lessons, but also the one who taught me to remember all the state capitals. Taught me my ABCs, made sure I had done my homework. She took my socks and she darned them. How many of you heard that phrase, darning socks? <laughs> That's another word we don't say anymore. I, when you say darned, sounds like darn it. But uh, she darned my socks. She put the medicine on me when I scraped myself up which was many times, she was the one who shepherded me. She had been a God to me. Now, I know that sounds kind of weird, Lord, as my grandmother, but think about it. Maybe it's easier for you to say, the Lord is like my grandmother or my grandfather or you fill in the blank. But David didn't say that. David said, the Lord is my shepherd, not the Lord is like a shepherd. Do you know someone who's a shepherd in your life? Think of someone who's a shepherd in your life. What do you remember about them? Just offering you an opportunity to have the memories of how you've been shepherded in your own life, how you have been provided for, protected, loved, cared for, guided, pulled back in when you have gone astray, found when you've been lost. And then think about where you are in your age and stage in life and how you have shepherded other people. Probably, first of all, think of our children or our grandchildren, people that we have provided for, people that we protect, people that we go out of our way to make sure they are safe. Maybe it reminds you when you first heard the psalm. What is it that sticks with you about that psalm? Is it that image of the green pastures? The quiet waters where you can go and rest somewhere in nature? 
Or is it being led by someone who knows the way? Someone who's older than you who knows the way? Or someone who knows how to do something you don't know? That YouTube video, I'm just kidding. Uh, but someone who knows more than you do, who is able to show you where to put your foot on the path. Or is it that comforting one that says, yea, though I walk through the valley of death, I am not afraid. I fear no evil because you're with me, because you protect me. Ever felt that reassurance when you're lying in bed at night and you think? Afraid of what tomorrow's going to bring? Afraid of what the next day, what the next headline is? What the next ache in your body is? What the next encounter with that family member is going to be like? Thou art with me. I think it's the most comforting line. And thou, like I had the kids say, isn't a very common word we say, but a relic from the past. But I think we hang on to that because it says something familiar to us. It speaks to us in some way. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the um, Jewish theologian Martin Buber, but he came up with a theory about the I thou theory. And he said, we often think of things in our lives as it, as it, I, it. Even some people, I, they. But he said, when you do that, you separate it, you objectify it. And he said, I, thou connotates a relationship with. I, thou. Beautiful way to think of our relationships with one another and our relationship with our higher power. Maybe I'm taking it too literally, but I don't really want to have dinner with my enemies. <laughs> Can you imagine going home to Sunday lunch and all those people that are kind of your enemies in life sitting around the table? I don't want to do that. But this translation we had today said, you prepare a table before me in the presence of all my fears. A little easier. A little easier. I think often we do sit down and have dinner and think about our fears. But the good news at this table is that whether it's fears or enemies, we're going to be blessed with oil. Blessed with oil. Maybe you don't like that so much blessing of oil, but you're going to be blessed. How about that? And there will be plenty to eat, and your cup will overflow. That goes back to the beginning where it says, I shall not want because my table is full, my cup is overflowing. We have days like that too. You have those days like that, just feel like, wow, everything's happened right. I got something in the mail that made me happy. I got money <laughs> i'm looking at don no i got i got something that made me really happy i shall not want one of my favorite parts in here though is surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life so it's not so much being led but it's being followed and the original hebrew it says pursued so we've translated into follow but imagine yourself being pursued by goodness Goodness is looking out for you. Goodness is coming after you. Mercy wants you. They're knocking on doors. Where are you? Where are you, Paul? Mercy's coming. Mercy's coming. Hey, mercy's on the way. Mercy's pursuing you. That's a wonderful image. It's a wonderful image. Very end, it gives us another nod towards life and living daily. It says, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life, here, now, and life. The ways in which we live are joyous, are banquet-filled. It's what we find in the presence of this community. Overflowing, thou art with me. Amen. Our middle hymn is, We Cannot Own the Sunlit Sky, in the Black Hymnal, page 563.
Well, another quick announcement. Gary and Meredith are on their way to Texas right now for services on Tuesday for Gary's dad. That word came in during the service. So for those of you who need to know or would like to know that. An invitation to give. Um, Eileen wanted me to mention that a portion of the proceeds for this year's art fair will actually be going to the Praying Hands Ranch. So uh, we will be supporting that mission and you will be supporting that mission by your participation in the art fair. As we prepare to pass the offering plates, both real and virtual, I can't think I can't but think that the art fair is a perfect application of God's gifts of time, talent, and treasure. Time. Take time to spread the word to family, friends, neighbors, workmates, and group affiliates. Our doors are open to everyone. What better time to show off our UCC extravagant welcome, our beautiful sanctuary, and our partnership with the schoolhouse, the Praying Hands Ranch, and as an element of our sense of community. Talent, well, that's what this is all about, isn't it? Artists, craftspeople, bakers, musicians, uh, there's, there's even authors. And you, set up, clean up, car parking, crowd control, take care of whatever we overlooked. Treasure, like those once treasured items that you have donated to the silent auction and your encouragement and financial support of our local artists, authors, youth, and food vendors. Not to mention UCCPH itself. See you at the art fair. good. Uh, our closing hymn is Draw the Circle Wide. It is return to the first hymnal, your paperback, Draw the Circle Wide, and we are actually going to do that this morning. We're going to draw the circle wide. So take your hymnal and move to the edges of the sanctuary and let us make a circle together. 
one, two, three in your hymnal. And you are invited to remain where you are as well if you don't want to move to the circle. Claire, Claire, Claire. I don't want to be alone though. I don't want to be standing alone. That's what it's, that's what it's. Are drawing the circle wide we are a place of wideness in the wideness is god's mercy surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life may the lord bless you and keep you may the lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you may the lord lift up the bright light of her countenance upon you and give you grace and peace all the days of your life amen